imagine taking over a job where your predecessor had just overseen five Olympic medals at the delayed Tokyo Olympic Games? Great Britain has a proud history at both the Olympics and Paralympics in equestrian sports. And following the successes of 2021, they announced the name of their new permanent performance director. I'm John. And I'm Michael, and it was a really interesting appointment. Someone whose background includes representing Great Britain at windsurfing, 10 years with British sailing, a role with UK Sport, and another PD role at Boccia UK. But maybe this was what sealed it at the interview. Our guest is a horse owner and passionate about riding. I'm Helen Nichols, Performance Director at British Equestrian, and I joined last year from Boccia UK. So the first question has to be... Was it because you were a horse owner in the past and passionate about riding? I don't think it was, actually. And I remember an interview um, having a, a conversation um, with the panel and saying, look, if you're looking for a horse expert, if you're looking for somebody who, who can um, bring the technical expertise to this programme, I'm not that person. Uh, my job is to employ those people. Um, so if you're looking for a horse expert, you probably don't want to look at my competition record in riding. Otherwise, you'd be um, definitely appointing the wrong person. Because some people say you have to have experience to lead a team, and particularly in sport, it seems that with sport, maybe it's with the emotions that and people love their sport so much that they want people who lead them to have that passion too. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you do have to have passion. You've got to have an absolute understanding and respect for the competitor who, no matter what it what sport it is, the moment you step on the start line, the moment you go to the starting arena that you've got to understand what that feels like and how much commitment and, and the risk that you're personally taking um, in putting yourself on the line. And, and, and actually that goes for everything. It goes for whether or not on a, you know, you're going down to your local park run. There's a reason people don't do that because they're frightened because it's intimidating. So even if you're doing a park run, a local 10K, you're going on your first cycling sporty, the respect that you have to have for people who are willing to put themselves on the line for me, that that's an absolute fundamental. You've got to have an understanding of that. What are the transferable skills then as performance director at Boccia UK to your current position? Um, I think it goes down to the understanding of the journey in sport. So for me, when you lead a team, you've got to have skin in the game. You've got to know, and the, and the athletes have got to know that you've got skin in the game, that you actually really care that you care and you understand what they've put into the journey and what they're trying to get out of it. Um, so the transferable skills are, you know, that, that they're in everything. It's about creating an environment where people can deliver their potential when somebody says now. And actually, you can go from sport to sport to sport. And I, I went to the World Championships this year with Equestrian for, you know, the first time. And everyone kept saying to me, what's it like being at a World Championships in, in Equestrian? It's like, well, actually, it's quite similar to fencing or skeleton and bobsleigh or sailing or mountain biking like the fundamentals are the same someone will forget their accreditation somebody will be worried about a rule infringement one of the coaches will be doubting their tactics the night before all the issues are, are genu genuinely the same across sports really and what was it about the job at British Equestrian that you thought hmm I, I fancy that 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 looks like it would suit me yeah, so I'd done a little bit of work with Equestrian over the years before, during my time, um, actually right back when I was at Sailing and we were doing some coach development work. And one of the issues we had in Sailing was the, the, um, that we were trying to do was bring in experts into the programme to come and deliver bits um, for the athletes and then go again without knocking the confidence of any of the, the coaches that we already had in the system. And Equestrian, I knew, were experts at that. So they would pay for an expert show jumping coach to come over from Holland or somewhere for a few days to coach the coaches. And that was an accepted cultural thing that, that was OK and it was seen positively. And I wanted to go over and have a look at that in a question and see how do they do that without threatening the coaches that they already had, without them feeling that their, their, their expertise was being challenged. So I've done a little bit of work with them on that. And then when I was at UK Sport, um, and I did a temporary role with them as performance advisor. And at that point, Equestrian was going through a few ups and downs internally. And I could see that they had some really, really good stuff. They had some bits of the jigsaw puzzle that were absolutely golden, but they were a bit scattered around and there were a few bits missing. 
And I sort of watched from afar um, for the next few years. And obviously, with my interest in horses, um, I watched them go through some really rough times. But all the time, I could see that they had really, really good athletes and really, really good coaches. And as somebody who fully, fully believes in the British sporting system and the lottery funding system, I found it actually quite sad to watch the sport having such a tough time when I knew there was bits in there that was so good. So I'd been um, at Botcher for a couple of years, had never any intention of leaving Botcher. I absolutely loved that, that role in that sport. That's one of the gems of the Paralympic movement. And the equestrian role came up and I spoke to a few people and, and they, they'd contacted me and, and we had um, various conversations. And, and I thought, Do you know what? I can make a difference here. I, I can I can add something here. And I think that I can work with some of these really, really good people and get some stability and help this sport stabilize and go on and do some really, really good stuff. So yeah, never want to back down from a challenge. I thought, oh, that's for me. <laughs> well, I want to talk about your career in a moment, Helen, because it is it is fascinating and, and your time at, at Botcher. But just on equestrian. Is it all Olympic and Paralympic horse related sport or how does it break down? Yeah. So in equestrian, there's millions of disciplines, vaulting, driving, all sorts, Um, horse ball, polo cross, everything. Um, But my remit just looks after the Olympic and the Paralympic disciplines. So just the four disciplines um, is under my remit. But I do have connection to the others because, of course, the health of the sport and the participation that, that's all you know it's all inextricably linked and so yes we do take an interest in in the other disciplines and we do try and make sure that the sport as a whole is healthy um so yes they don't come under my watch um directly but it's part of that overall big package and is it a sport where you could have a, a wide range of people taking part from people who might be the oldest member of Team GB, for example, and then potentially the youngest member of Paralympic GB. It's such an, in, an inclusive sport in, oh, in some ways, age wise. Absolutely. And that, that's what's so brilliant about it. You know, when we went to the World Championships, um, the reserve for the show jumping team was John Whitaker. The amazing, famous, hugely, hugely talented John Whitaker, the horse that he had at that time, he was in reserve. So he didn't actually compete, but he came to the World Championships and he supported and guided the show jumping team alongside the performance managers and the coaches quietly in the background and helped them deliver that bronze medal. And on that team, you had two of the young um, athletes, Joe Stockdale and Harry Charles, at their first ever World Championships. And you just look at that dynamic and you and you think that's what sport should be. That's really, really healthy. That's really, really good. Um, so yeah, so we have a huge age range, you know, and we have male and female athletes competing on the same field at the same time. There is no discussion ever about male, female balances, etc. It's just, you know, one sport. Can anybody get into your sport? Are there barriers still? Is it expensive, for example, to get to? the level that you're looking after at Olympics and Paralympics? Yeah, it is. Is it, you know, and there's no hiding away from that. But, you know, from my experience with other sports, none more so, you know, every single sport, when you get to the very, very highest levels, there is a real commitment that's needed. And that is a, a choice that people have to make when they can start getting to that levels. The barriers to getting in at, at the very lowest levels Anybody can go and ride. Anybody can go to their local riding centre, especially as a kid, and go and join a group lesson. Um, and that would be equivalent to going down to, you know, a canoe club or a rowing club and paying your fees and going and doing that. Doing that. Um, so, yes, the, what, what we're trying to look at as well is some of the barriers to participation, at, at, you know, across the board. What can we do to make it more accessible? What, what can we do to make sure that when you've got talented riders in the system and they get to a certain level, that there is routes for them, that they can see that it's possible. Because, um, yeah, there's no there's no denying that to fill your, your, your lorry and your car full of fuel and travel to Europe now is, is eye-wateringly expensive. But um, no different to if you're trying to take your boat or, your, you know, your, your bike or, or it's... Um, you know, sport's got a real challenge uh, across the board at the moment with cost because it's, it, it's not an easy thing to do at a weekend for families. And in terms of the visual nature of your sport, is it as visual as it always was? I remember growing up, badminton, burley, these Mm. would be fixtures on the television. 
Olympia was a highlight of the Christmas TV schedule. It's not quite the same now. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that's a real challenge for us and other sports. I think, you know, the media um, coverage is, isn't it? 75% football in mainstream media and 15% is horse racing. And then the remaining few percentages split across all the other sports. You know, and, and you're right that, that the visual image of equestrian sports up close is just mind blowing. And you're right. People used to sit didn't they, just before Christmas and watch Olympia on TV. But nowadays that 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 isn't you know, what what the media are looking at. So we have to think of creative ways of, of making sure that that there is space. There is space that, you know, we, we do inch back some of that 75 percent of football coverage in the media. And you mentioned earlier about what you wanted to bring to British Equestrian. You thought there were there were gaps there and you could help. Because um, that's interesting from our point of view, because as Michael said in his intro, you know, five Olympic medals, lots of success at, at the Paralympics as well. Yeah, yeah. In all programmes, one of the things that I've always thought is that the healthy thing is that you've got people that think opposite to you. That when you're looking at things, you don't, everybody doesn't always say, yes, that's the right thing to do. You need people that are around the table that are seeing things from different points of view. Um, You know, and in equestrian, that's absolutely, they want that. That's their, you know, that's welcomed because they're they're used to having such a, you know, it's a complex dynamic with a rider, with a horse, with a coach, and with the technical aspect that they want as many people around that table that can see things through a different set of eyes um than than they can so coming in from the outside actually actually that's as long as you do it in the the right way and everybody understands your intent the challenges around the way we do things and how we do it how we can support is really good it's really really healthy um you know and the team is hugely successful massively successful and our job is to make sure that that's sustainable that we're not relying on one coach who's you know, away for, from home for 290 nights a year. And, and, you know, really, that's not sustainable. How do we make sure that is sustainable and that, that we can support better? Because often equestrian from a British point of view, like British sailing, uh, is a banker. You know that you're going to get these these gold medals, and I'm sure Team GB sit there in UK Sport going, "Well, yeah, we we can put you guys down for for these medals." But we saw with British rowing, where it was a banker before Tokyo and and during Tokyo, certainly at the Olympics, it, it certainly wasn't. And that's how mm. sport can suddenly slip, can't it? You can't just assume that it carries on as it's always been. Absolutely, you're completely right, and. Um... It's really funny, actually. I had this conversation with somebody the other day and they said, oh, you know, do you worry about the results? And I said, do you know what? The one thing I never, ever lie awake at night worrying about is the results, because this is sport. That's why you do it, because in the morning you don't know what the results going to be in the in the afternoon. And if you did know that, you wouldn't you wouldn't worry about it. Like You wouldn't do it, would you? And yes, of course, in some sports, it's more predictable. And the ironic thing about you saying a question, the banker. The question is probably the most unpredictable sport that there is because, you know, show jumping, it takes one horse to have one pole down and you can fall from second to seventh. You know, in, in, in eventing, it takes one horse to have a run out on cross country and you don't complete. It, it is really, really, really fine margins. Um, so if anybody ever sat there and thought, oh, you know, questions a banker, I would really question their understanding of the sport (laughs) because, you know, and it's, it's the thing that we don't worry about because our job and the athletes jobs is to prepare themselves and the horses and the environment as best as possible. And then you go to the start box and you do your best on the day. And if you win, that's fantastic. And if you come forth, that's also fantastic. And actually the more important thing is when you do your review afterwards, you review the same way, whether you came first, whether you came fourth or whether you came 10th, because you might come 10th and you might still have done exactly the same thing. And you might come first, you might have done a load of things differently next time. You're listening to Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy. We're in conversation with Helen Nichols, the Performance Director at British Equestrian. Let's talk a bit about you, your background, Helen. How near, how far did you get to competing at the Olympics and it wasn't an equestrian we should say no it wasn't at all it was um definitely on a different field of play on the water 
So I learned to windsurf when I was about 10. My father and my older brother were windsurfers. And um, and I was a cross-country runner, actually. And I, I raced um, cross-country up till I was sort of 15, 16. But I also learned to windsurf with them. And I, I got better and better. And I loved it. I loved the risk. I loved the speed. And um, I just happened to be sailing one day um, at a lake. And the British sailing team had some talent spotters there. And they hooked me along. And before I knew it, I was... Um, racing at a under 15 world championships and and it went from there really and I, I I loved it because it's like the whole secret in sport the more you train the better you get it's funny you know people are always looking for what's the edge what's the edge well if you train really hard and you're really consistent you do get better and so I just trained really hard and I got better and better and better um and then as I as I got older I went into the the national team um and I started racing on the international circuit at sort of age 18 19 I raced around the world in amazing places New Caledonia Australia America Bermuda so a fantastic life for a 19 20 year old but uh, but tough you know really really tough and um and then in sailing you'll you'll probably know that only one person from each class goes to the games and we did our trials for Sydney in April in Weymouth. And it was pretty windy. It was a pretty windy week. And my specialism was um, lighter winds. And so I came second at the trials. So I was the reserve for Sydney. So in some ways, if I look back at it, I went to Sydney and I, you know, um, did all the reckeys, did all the sailing in Sydney, but I didn't actually go to the game. So I still had a really good time. <laughs> but um and, and actually, I was devastated at the time. But when I actually look back, it's probably the best thing that happened to me. Because I went from there and I stepped back and I, I looked at, well, what have I learned? What can I do? What's my expertise? And I need to finish my degree. And so I stepped back and did that. And then I, I got asked to do some coaching for some of the youth um, teams and take them abroad. And which I think is the old school way of baptism of fire of coaching. So here's a bunch of teenagers. You need to take them abroad. They need to race. They need to do quite well. You need to bring them all back to their parents alive and not in jail. And, um, and if you succeed that, I think that's you've passed all your coaching badges. And um, so I did that and I actually really enjoyed it. And, it, you know, it, as most coaches will tell you, it's probably more about human management than technical management at that time. So I'd managed these, these group of unruly teenagers um, and I'd obviously not done, not done too bad a job because I get kept giving more and more and more. Um, so I finished my degree and as I finished my degree, a coast at the British sailing team came up for the national coach for windsurfing across all the disciplines and I was asked if I would apply for it. So I applied for it and I got it. So, you know, and a, a huge, huge... Um, thanks throughout my whole career to John Derbyshire, the previous performance director of British Sailing, because he's the guy that he could have employed somebody who was had a track record, was really experienced, was really stable, but he didn't. He took a risk on me and he guided and supported me throughout my whole career when I made mistakes, when I got it right, when I got it wrong. And he just nurtured me along. I was the only female in the programme and he just took a risk. And um you know, I look back and I, I sometimes shiver at how awful I must have been in my first couple of years in the job. But you get better because you're doing it and you learn by experience. I don't imagine that Charlotte Dujardin or Sir Lee Pearson offer you the same challenges as those unruly teenagers did back in the day. <laughs> Do you still enjoy windsurfing? Do you still get out of the water? I don't, actually. I probably windsurfed the last time about... It's probably about 10 years ago and I was on holiday with some friends and they had some windsurfing kit and I had my children with me and they didn't really knew, knew that I could windsurf really. They didn't know much about it. And it was really, really windy and it was massive waves. And anyway, the guy who had the kit, um, it was too windy for him. He said, oh, do you want it, Helen? So I said, oh, OK, I'll borrow it. So I jumped on it and off I went. And my kids were just, they, they couldn't believe it that I could do it and um but I don't because it's a very very um all-encompassing sport that isn't really compatible for me with two kids and a family you know uh, if I've been away working and I come back and I say by the way I'm going away on my own today going windsurfing the day it just probably doesn't go down that well so don't really windsurf too much anymore so I think it was 10 years 
at British Sailing, and you said you worked with with UK Sport as well, working with different um, as a performance advisor with different sports, and then in in into Boccia. You said you're a huge fan of the UK sports system. Do you think that is something that will continue? Um, it's been very well supported for 25, 30 years. Um, London 2012, obviously the government funded part of, uh, of of elite athletes as well. With everything that's going on at the moment with recession and, and cost of living, etc. Is that something that you think is really important that actually is maintained? I think it is. I, I absolutely fundamentally do think it is because it's, you know, the, the new UK sports strap line is medals and more. But for me, it's always been about the more because there are very, very few athletes that leave world class programs with medals around their necks skipping down the corridor because in sport, not many people win. That's the point of it. And so there are so much more that the UK sports system does than just create medals. They create athletes with huge life experiences that know how to commit and how to train that know how to deal with pressure that know how to manage other human beings um it, they create coaches and staff and physios and expertise that makes us at the absolute top of the world in terms of expertise in sport management and we've got it's almost like a, a one of the most high performing university systems in the world for sport and you've got all these people walking around, you know, I think over 4,500 athletes have been through the World Class Programme system. And every one of those athletes will have gained experiences and skills through that system that they can go into all walks of life, um, you know, and gain from that. So the medal bit is obviously very important. And the success, you know, how great does it feel to be Great Britain when you go, you, you watch the games at um you know, in Tokyo or in Rio or in London, and we're successful. That feels amazing, doesn't it? And, you know, when you speak to people on the street, you know, my neighbour who knows nothing about sport, but when the Olympics are on, she comes around and she is so excited that, you know, the badminton's tomorrow or the, you know, and she knows nothing about sport. But for her, she's proud that our guys are going out there and being successful. So it does really matter to me. And, um, and I think when you look at what it, the output of it, we just need to do a better job of describing, articulating them more, because that's massive. Well, to be fair, the way that you just described it has been the best description that I've ever heard. It's the investment, not just on a sports side, but in in life and giving these people experience, but also a university. What a great uh, description of that. Um, that and it explains it a bit more rather than just, as you say, here's some money, go and win a, go and win a medal. Just on that, though, Helen, it is a performance director of of um, a British team at the moment one of the hardest places to be? Because, yes, there is that expectation of the medals, um, but there is the more as well. And it is a it's about supporting uh, the generation of athletes coming through now one and, and rightly should have more support maybe than what they had previously or previous generations. Yeah, I actually think they probably always have had lots of support and the more. And, and it goes, for me, it goes down to the fundamental questioning of why people are doing the roles they're doing. And I push really hard on that with all of our staff. Why are you doing it? And what are you trying to do? And so, for example, if you're a human physio working in our programme, why are you doing that? Why is it so important to you to work with these athletes to do this? And actually, when you push down to the why and you really push down, it's because they really care about these athletes having the potential to succeed. And you, and, and, and you get to a lot of the um, that bit about support for athletes when you push on the why. Because all of the people that work on our programme, they would work on Christmas Day, Boxing Day, 24 hours a day if they thought it would help increase the athlete's potential 1% more. And as long as you can be confident that everybody in your team has got their why aligned to what you're doing, then I think the athletes should always feel really supported. That's not to say we will always give the athletes they want the answer they want to hear. Because sometimes with an athlete, what they want and what they need are not necessarily the same things. And then that's part of my job in terms of the management of helping athletes sometimes see a bit, a bit what I went to before in that being confident enough to ask for opinions and views that are directly opposite to yours is a really healthy thing and helping athletes get to that place where they can 
they search for that themselves. That's the good place. And that's when they actually feel supported. They don't feel threatened. So can you kind of explain to me what a normal working week is as performance director <laughs> at British Equestrian? Do you have a nine to five? I, I don't think in British sport there is a norm. Um, so, yeah, so my, so my day-to-day tasks, I, I always describe it as a bit like being the conductor of an orchestra. So you've got all different bits going on. And sometimes you've got a problem over in the wind section. Sometimes, you know, the bass section is, is up. And sometimes you need to um, go in and, and support specific areas. So a week for me. Um, so I always try and work at home on a Monday if I can. So just so that I can get my week sorted out and any of the issues that have arisen over the weekend, which might have been, you know, a team overseas at an event or whatever, or I need to um, have a whole list of people to phone or whatever. I try and do that on a Monday if I can. On a Tuesday, I always try and make sure I'm in the office. So we've got an office up in Warwickshire, and that's where um, a lot of our operations guys work. Um, and I always try and make sure we have face-to-face time in the office on a Tuesday. Um, and then the rest of the week, I tend to be traveling. So, for example, the last couple of weeks, I've been in meetings where we have been redoing the program selection for the entire program for the next year. So we've had four days of meetings going through hundreds of athletes and who we think um, we can offer support to, who we think need a different program, etc. And then other weeks I might be going out to see an athlete in their yard or go and speak to them about a certain issue or something that we think we can help them with. Or I might be going out and seeing one of our um, programme managers who look after one of the disciplines. And and we often do things such as, you know, thinking meetings where we might just meet in a cafe or somewhere and we just think and we talk. Because often you don't come up with your best ideas when you're sitting at your desk or sitting in a meeting room going, right, we've got to think now. You, you, you think about them on the drive there and then you sit down with somebody over coffee and you often come up with some really good stuff then. So, um, and then if it's season, if we're in competitive season, um, where I'm relatively new to the role, I try and make sure that I'm on the ground at each of the major competitions. So a fair amount of traveling and a fair amount of um, watching and observing at the moment. Yeah, how important is it for you to be seen by the athletes, by their coaches, by their support teams? I think it's really important. If I go back to when I was an athlete, if I had an issue or wanted to talk to somebody about something, I think I'd really struggle to just pick up the phone and speak to somebody that I'd never met before. Whereas if I'd met them at a competition and they just even patted me on the back and go, you know, well done out there, oh, that's tough. I just feel more confident to pick up the phone and say, I just want to speak to you about this. So for me, building a relationship, you you can never ever have influence, I don't think, unless you've got a relationship. And so building the relationships and, and, and for me, understanding as well, understanding what the athletes, the coaches, the environment is like so that I can actually help um, is really important. So yeah, um, I've, um, been to more horse shows and stables than um, I could have predicted over the past six months. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, two more questions for me. You said it was hard to leave Botcher. How tough was it? Oh, it was really, really hard. Um, that is a sport that is absolutely about ability. So it's a Paralympic sport and it's at the extreme end of the classification for Paralympic sports. So athletes with the the most severe disabilities. And it, we don't, in the sport, we never talked about disability. We talked about ability all the time because those athletes are the, it's it's like playing chess, but with the chess pieces having to be rolled and the strategy and tactics of it are just, absolutely mind-blowing and you think the physical skill is quite straightforward I could learn to do that sometimes I would play the athletes and I'd play four ends I wouldn't score one point and I was lucky if I still had a ball on the court at the end they are so good and you know the sport it it's brutal when I went to the games with them in Tokyo I think it would have been more pleasurable to be in boxing and watching your athletes being punched in the face 
it was so brutal watching your athletes lose a bronze medal on a tie break by one millimeter. It would have been kind to just punch them in boxing. You know, it was, oh, it is the best sport ever in Paralympic. And if you're ever, ever watching the Paralympics on TV, watch the boxer, watch the finals, because it is that is what elite sport is all about. Mm. Absolutely. I can I can tell the passion is, is there. So uh, changing tack slightly with my last question. What can we expect from British Equestrian from Team GB and Paralympics GB in Paris? So it's next year. It's early 2023. Yeah. It's next year already. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, what you can expect, first of all, is an amazing visual watch because the equestrian events are going to be at the Palace in Versailles. So I went out a couple of weeks ago and um. You just look at that long drive um, to, to Versailles, the palace, and the equestrian events are going to be at the top of that drive. It wow. is going to be stunning. And the eventing course goes down the drive. It goes through the water, through the, um, the lake in front of Versailles and back up. So first of all, it's going to be a visual, like absolute spectacle. And then secondly, everybody is in really good form. So last year we had the World Championships, which was the qualifier is an opportunity to qualify. I was told when I joined that never do we qualify early. We always leave it to the last minute. It's always really difficult. And we always have to, you know, chase everybody around to make sure that we do actually qualify. Well, by the end of September, every single discipline had qualified and got their place. So I'm hoping that's a good omen. <laughs> um, but it, do, it does mean that the focus on running into Paris can just be on performance. They don't have to chase qualification. And um, that's a really big thing when you're working with horses that you can do the program that is right for them rather than the program that's dictated by a calendar. Um, so that's a real advantage. And like I said before, do I lie awake the night before worrying about results? No, I lie awake worrying about have we done everything we can to support them in the best way? Have we got the preparation right? And the result will be what it will be. Well, Helen Nichols, Performance Director at British Equestrian. We wish you so much luck on that journey to Paris next year. Thank you very much for talking to great British bosses from anything but footy. Thank you very much for having me.